person who betrays an organization or a set of principles. To the treachery, to treasure, <laughs> don't hear where I'm not going, <laughs> to treacherously change allegiance, it comes from the Latin to renegatus, or renounce, the past tense of a renegator. Re-expressing intense force in the gear to deny. So the song came on the radio, and it just started causing stuff inside of me to bubble up. And I'm like, it made me think about the revivalists that I've fallen on at school ministry in different environments. And these dudes were renegades, these men and women. <laughs> they got a vision that set them on fire. Nothing can stop them. They became burning ones. Not in a dishonoring or rebellious way, but in the way that said, I choose to be consumed every day of my life, and this thing which I've tasted of is my only option in life, and that's what I'm going to give the rest of my life for. A pioneer was also in the song. A pioneer is a French word. It means a foot soldier who prepares the way for the army. The crazy ones with crazy faces that went out ahead of everyone else. Desire something caused the three dudes to risk their life to sneak through the entire camp of the army to go get a sip of water for their king. Now, where does revival come from? Where is it born? I imagine each one of us in here have had encounters with Jesus. Am I right? Yeah. Whether it's super radical or whether it's... You know, I came in here from Mount Newton and I really want Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you know? I mean, it could be the day-to-day -day small things or it could be the, the big, huge things. And so when I recount the lives of the revivalists, I see that when they encounter those moments, they encounter them with 100% of their lives, of their beings, of who they are. Yeah. And the mo those moments become a collective that culminates into the damn breaking in their life and their generation. Not as if the damn God's holding back. He's not holding back. Revivalist is a guy named Evan Roberts. Yeah. Who's heard of Evan Roberts? Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was the 
the kind of unconventional leader of the Welsh revival. <laughs> the Welsh revivals, if you kind of look at that one and compare it to others, it, it kind of stands out on its own as this unique thing, this bizarre phenomenon. It started with this one man and it, and it consumed an entire nation. You know, Evan Roberts grew up, and the way people described him was as deeply spiritual. And then it got so bad, his parents took him to a psychiatrist. And the, the doctor's kind of like, it seems like your, your boy's kind of consumed with a, a, a strange religious, religious fervor. <laughs> religious fervor. He would also be standing on, seen standing on the street corners, just kind of. You know, doing this thing. He was obviously engaging in the world, but the people around him had no perspective for that. Yeah. Yeah. So that by the time he was 20 years old, he was known as a mystical lunatic. And this is a culture that, if you compare it to ours today, there's much more awareness of like godly principles of the Bible, of things like that. So for someone in that environment to kind of stand out of the crowd was pretty intense. When everybody went to church, the whole society was kind of based on that. I mean, it was you know in a religious sense, but not not like a, a full blown revival sense. But still, for someone to kind of stick out of the crowd was a pretty big deal. So Evan Roberts. So there's a few stories from his life. Let me find them in my notes. There he is. Everybody say hi, Evan. Hi. Is everybody tracking? Am I kind of all over the place? You guys doing good? Yeah. All right. He lived from 1878 to 1951. Was consumed by God at a young age, had a reputation for being deep to spiritual known as mystical lunatic by the time he was 20. Um, often in trances on the street corner. The word trance is the same word as rapture or ecstasy. It's like a, a vision that's so consuming, this natural world disappears and all you see is the heavenly realm. So what is, what is evangelism? One of the things you'll hear me say a lot is, when I first got saved, I would put on my evangelism hat and I would go evangelize like a robot. Excuse me. Hey, guy. Jesus loves you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> He's trying. That weren't an Isaac, but... Um, but the more I got consumed with God, I found evangelistic encounters in my wake. They became a, a trail behind me of people I had met in the day-to-day -day life. Now, I'm all about doing outreaches and taking the city and all that kind of stuff. The evangelism is a part of your life. If you look at the lives of some of these revivalists, they were just, they, they had this problem to where they were the same person in public that they were in private. Yeah. You, go. you can see it in revivals, you can see it in the lives of people. They would burn privately, they would burn publicly. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that as an individual, you can also do it as a group. I don't know if you noticed, but all of Newton isn't in here right now. But you guys have chosen for the last several weeks to come here on Thursdays and Fridays and begin to burn. So in one sense, this can be a public setting if you're talking individualistically, but as a group, this is a private setting where those coals in that oven are getting hot. And that fire can come out 
around in this place and just naturally expand. <laughs> naturally expand. Back to Evan. So Evan gets baptized in the Spirit. And he's, he's in bed, he's praying, he gets baptized in the Spirit, and his whole bed starts shaking. It's pretty intense. And they went to this period of, of divine fellowship where from 1 to 5 a.m. for a period of months, every single night, he would just, you know, go to heaven. You know, four hours a night for month after month. I think it was about six months. So as a young man, he didn't care that people called him a mystical lunatic. He didn't care what the milk man thought about him when he was standing on the street corner going into an ecstasy to see the heavenly realms in his area, in his city, and in his nation. After that, he went to Bible college and he heard a fiery old guy. Dude, you guys just need to get around fiery old guys. Get around those guys. Everybody needs, you know, just a couple or three of fiery old guys in your life. You'll, you'll be just fine. Can <laughs> I get a name in? Fiery. We can't. It's not gender specific, but you can say, you know, fiery, wise ladies. Fiery old guys and fiery wise ladies. He hears Seth Joshua talking about his, his passion for the young people and for the nation. He says, bend us, O oh God, bend us. Evan Roberts is at the meeting. He gets done hearing this guy speak. He's him and the Bible students get invited out to go eat dinner with Seth, jo Seth Joshua. Everyone's engaging in dinner. Evan's just sitting there mumbling stuff to himself. Finally, he gets up and he goes back in the church by himself and he's just saying, Bend to me, God. Bend to me, God. Bend to me, God. Bend to me, God. He heard something that hit that deep place inside of him and it completely rips his life wide open. Him and his, after that, him and his friend Cindy Evans are talking, they're dreaming, they're on fire now. And, and Evan looks at Sydney and he goes, do you think God can give me 100,000 souls? And his friend's like, yeah, let's do it. It wasn't like, I don't know, man, let's start with him. Let's kind of work our way up. I mean, ten's a good goal. It's, you know, some are given five talents, some are given one, some are given ten. It's not the amount, it's what you do with the amount that you're given. What do you have faith for? What do you have passion for? Take that and set it on fire! They're walking down the street at night. They look up at the moon and they see a hand stretch out from the moon and pick up the nation of Wales. Pretty gnarly vision. Yeah. Pretty cool. And they're like, right on, let's do it. That's a sign we can take the nation. They weren't like, ah, there's a hand stretched out from the moon. They're like, yes, this is our moment. God bless you. So he goes back to his home church. He's on fire. He's excited. I think he was 19. Who's 19 in here? Who's 18? 19, 20? I didn't say 19 times 2, Scott. I said 19. You know, David was 17 when he killed Goliath. And so, oh yeah, so he goes after church to meet with the young people, but people from all ages show up. There are 17 people in the room. Now there's more than that tonight, but like the last few times I've taught this in different settings, there's actually 17 people in like three or four settings in a row. It's pretty crazy. 
There's 17 people in the room. He just begins to share his heart about what God's doing. And that fire spreads. They're like, let's do this again tomorrow night. Okay. Twice as many people show up. By the end of the week, there's so many people there, they couldn't fit in the building. Six weeks later, 100,000 people had come into the kingdom in Wales. Six weeks. Amen. Six weeks from now. You dare to believe? Come on. Yes. Why not? They did it. Are they more special? Did God give them bigger bridges than they gave us? Are the people in here more special than you? They're standing all around us right now. We're saying, come on, you can do it. Grab hold. Everything we did was for you. And if you don't take the torch, then everything we did was worthless. If this is inspiring your own life and testimony, you might as well burn it. It's not meant to sit on a shell. And it's not meant to do this every day. It's meant to do this. Evan was known by his friends as a particle of radium whose fire in their midst was consuming. I want my friends to say that about me, not to puff me out, but because I've, I've tapped into it, and they recognize it, and we can burn together. You guys want to do tonight? I don't know. What do you want to do, Frankie? I don't know. You want to invite Jimmy over? Oh, Jimmy. <laughs> no, Jimmy. Jimmy's like a particle of radium. When, his, when he comes in, it's like a fire in our midst and it kind of consumes us. Frankie's like, yeah, let's go, Jimmy. So I think about Isaac. Whoa! I don't want to get around this dude right here. He's going to burn. Professional message, but keep going. <laughs> Next up, George Whitfield. Who knows? Who's heard of George? Whitfield. Whitefield. Whitfield. I think it's technically Whitefield, but imagine it with a British accent. 
The Great Awakening, 1739 to 1791, was led by George Whitfield, Charles, and John Wesley. And they actually started the Methodist movement. You wouldn't know it, but these were the Bethel movement of their day. They were the fiery, crazy, gnarly ones. They were the burning ones. George Whitfield had 25 students meet in his room. I'm sorry, Charles Wesley had 25 in his room. John Wesley had 25 in his room, and Whitfield had students in, in their dorm rooms at Oxford University. You have an entire denomination. It might not be one it used to be, but it's covering the globe now because 25 people chose to meet together in the dorm room and just go after Ted. They didn't even know how to do it. They were imposing strict rules on themselves just to be heavenly. Their methods of achieving holiness. But what was heaven's response? I can do something with that. There's something in their hearts I see that I can invade earth through. Details of Great Awakening, just some quick facts in Georgie. Hey, George, if you're hanging out watching this. So, they have a thing called the Methodist Pentecost, and then George Whitfield gets ordained, and he said it was like the hand of God came down and set me on fire. And he'd be, from that day on, when he spoke, it was thunderous. And so many people showed up at the church to hear him speak. I think the, the room contained 200. And the next night, it was 2,000. And he's like, I'll go outside to speak. He went outside. That was a renegade in his day and age. He went outside to preach. Everyone's like, what are you doing? Bro. Because... Because 1,700 eagle was full of servers. <laughs> like, bro. <laughs> he goes outside with his wig and his long clerical gown on. Yep. But still, he went outside. I mean, you know, he got to the gown and stuff later. But Scott likes to wear gowns when he speaks. It's amazing. <laughs> it's more free. It's more free. <laughs> I just had to put a mind break on right there. <laughs> so 200 swelled to 20,000 in six days. He was known as the awakener and the fire breaker. Hey, what do you do? Yeah, hey, I'll have a triple minty cinnamon dolce. Okay, Mr. Awakener. <laughs> being silly, but often he would barely begin to speak when the fire would start falling on people. It wasn't just vocabulary. It was vocabulary coming out of his mouth that was baptized, that was immersed in heaven. It was sounds put together that formed the words that came from another world. And that thing that people outside of here that drives them to do what they do or it depresses them because they feel like they can't achieve it, when they get around people that have it, they start to recognize it. When you're walking in the fullness of who you are and who you were created to be, you're going to get around others. You won't even have to say anything. I used to go in places and people would kind of look at me. And I, for the longest time, I thought it was, I thought it was because I was handsome. <laughs> <laughs> or me and my wife would be in a restaurant. The whole thing's empty. Like, there's no one in there. And it's not a restaurant where they seat you. We're, like, sitting by ourselves. There's no one in the whole restaurant. And the people come and sit right next to us. Like, right next to us. I'm like, why are you sitting? The whole restaurant's empty. <laughs> Maybe it's just my way of viewing life, but it happened like thousands of times, like hundreds of times. And so finally we're realizing, subconsciously, there's, there's glory in the room. 
I got, I got to go sit next to these people. And here I am, I sit next to me, not realizing that Jesus is trying to do something, you know? The one I read words of knowledge made easy by Scott Thompson, I began to recognize that that was actually... <laughs> They would throw dead cats at Winfield when he would preach. <laughs> and who thinks of that? Like, do you, do you find a dead cat along the way? Kill it. I mean, what do you... And they would hit him, they would come back to life. This <laughs> 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 it's, it's like, I can hear. <laughs> at times, the manifestations in his meaning were beyond description. People were carried off in scores. John Wesley was pretty much the, the father of the First Great Awakening and the Methodist movement. But he was a little bit different personality and different gifting than Whitfield. Often when he would begin to speak, the sounds of weeping and repenting would overpower him. He wouldn't even get to talk. What you carry doesn't have to look like what I carry or what I'm doing, but what you carry, as Leif Hedlin says, is your special sauce. It's that element that that person's going to need in the moment. So be free. You have permission to be you. You have permission to be set on fire. There's another guy named Charles Grandison Finney. I don't have the picture of him. This is your homework. When you go home, just look up a picture of Charles Finney from 100 years ago and look into his eyes. Archaic cameras were able to capture that fire in his eyes from over 100 years ago. People were praying for his salvation. And they're like, you need Jesus. He's like, why do I need Jesus? I watch you guys pray all the time and nothing happens. He's like, nothing in your life looks like what I read in the Bible, so why do I need Jesus? But still, something started to happen deep down inside of him. Something began to stir. And he decides to go out in the woods and pray, and he gets baptized mightily in the Holy Spirit. He never even heard of the baptism of the Spirit. So some people hear, oh, Charles Finney, the warrior, he got touched by Jesus. And so he shows up at a prayer meeting, and everyone's like, would you like to share your experience? He's like, okay, sure. He stands up to share his experience, and everyone hits the deck. <laughs> you have permission to be brave to share your experience. You have permission. One time he was speaking at a schoolhouse, so it was probably no bigger than this. And he, as soon as he began to speak, people began to just fall in different directions out of their chairs. He said if he had two swords in each hand, he couldn't have cut them out of their chairs quicker. Word about him began to spread as whole cities began to get transformed. And cities would call and invite him. It wasn't like, hey, you know, you got invited to speak, you know, at, you know, Fire Church in Orlando. It's, no, Orlando has called. They want you to come. The whole city calls. When he was in Rochester, New York, I think it was 1922, after revival had broken out in the city, they could not find one person who was unconverted. The city population at the time was 68,000. You have permission to take cities. He did.
They were revivalists. They were renegades. They were renegades because they wouldn't let any type of system ever hold back their fire. Again, it wasn't rebellious, it wasn't dishonoring. They had fathers, they had fellowship. They had elements in their life. But they were willing to be those pioneers. So Fiddy Man, I mean, one time he's in the factory. He's going to check the factory out. And he walks up to a lady and she sees him coming. You know? She's kind of doing her thing in the cotton gin or whatever she was working on. She kind of notices him walk in. And he starts to get closer and closer. She starts to fret a little bit, like, you know. Dude's coming over here. And finally he gets right up next to her. And she falls down. I can't take it anymore. And so repentance just kind of exploded in the factory at that point. And the owner of the factory shut the factory down. He's like, why should we work when the Lord's at work in here? You know, one of the cities he was in, revival was happening, and the sheriff of the nearby city went to the other city just to mock the revival and what was happening. So he's on his way, of course, back, whatever he's doing. The further he gets to this, the closer he gets to the center of the city, the more it intensifies. So by the time the guy just gets to the center of town, he falls on his face repenting. He went somewhere to the mock. He went to the epicenter of revival and had an encounter. <laughs> I've been around a few guys in my life I'm like staring at them eyeball to eyeball and it's like I just gotta look away it was so intense you know and then if you, if you, if you look up Finney you'll see that in his face it's, yeah. it's amazing so the, these revivalists they were oracles The word oracle is a Latin word. It basically means to speak. Or divine announcement. To live a prophetic life isn't just to give a prophetic word. Your lifestyle and actions, the way you engage your world perception... Your very life is a prophecy demonstrating what heaven is like in the earth. Who's heard of Duncan Campbell? Duncan Campbell. I got this. He was the leader of the Hebrides revival. Who's heard of the Hebrides revival? <laughs> Double bicep. <lesson. laughs> I have. <don't know. laughs> What's up, dude? How's it going? So. The Hebride Islands in Scotland, they're like the most northern part of Scotland, kind of way up in like the top of the world, right? Yep. You always see revival happening in like these crazy places, you know? Hebrides, you know, um, Pensacola, Noonan, it's crazy. Ah, that's right. Ah. Stockbridge. Oh, yeah. So, where you guys at? Is it Stockbridge? <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> I told you life's prophetic and it works not. 
So there's these two old ladies, and they're praying for revival, and they're disabled, and they can't leave their home. And they get a vision that God's going to come and touch the young people in their island. And so they send for a man to come. Duncan Campbell arrives. These two ladies have been priming the pump for years, priming the pump, priming the pump. Like we said before, pulling on the curtains, pulling on the strings to get the curtain to lift. Duncan Campbell shows up. He kind of shares his heart at a meeting. And then after the, the meeting, they all decide to stay and pray. And then one of those fiery old guys stands up. Get down. <laughs> Falls to his knees. And just ask for him to come. Four AM. Everybody in the village is, you know, asleep. Except those, I think it was like four people in there. And all of the sun people in the surrounding houses get up and they walk outside. What is going on? Because heaven came down in the whole area. Yes. The awareness of God grip the community. This revival was wild. So think about being in here at the school. We're talking about Jesus. We're talking about revival. All of a sudden, people from the surrounding businesses start pulling into the parking lot. They're like, what is going on? We know God's moving. We just, we just got drawn to this location. We got drawn to you. Entire localities getting gripped by the presence of God. Smith Wigglesworth was riding on a train and he drove, went by a village on the train and people start coming out of their homes. What is going on? And start repenting, falling on their faces. It's just you being you, letting that fire burn. You go into Starbucks on fire. You order your latte. <laughs> Extra hot. <laughs> Extra hot. <laughs> me, and my, me and my friends went to Brownsville back in the day. And... My friend Brandon started shaking. What? <laughs> he shook. Was it four weeks or two months? Like this. He couldn't stop day and night. He's vibrating in the presence of God. We're coming back. We stop at one of those places like you don't stop at to eat. You know? It's like buffet, you drive, and the, the building's brown. And Strange, and you go in. And he's shaking the whole time. The waitress is just trying to kind of ignore it. <laughs> oh, I'm just bacon. And he hands her the money to pay. She puts her hand out the rat. As soon as his hand touches hers. get impacted by this revival what God was doing. People were taking a shortcut to the church. They were crossing a field. They look up. Heaven's completely open. They see angels flying around everywhere, ascending and descending. They're walking through the field. They see rolling fireballs rolling through the field. Some guy's walking down the street in a halo. It's like a beam, like, you know, Star Trek or something. A pillar of light all around them.
So you get around these oracles, they just sound, their voice sounds like revival. Go ahead and play that last, that last clip. This is Duncan Campbell talking about the revival. mystical lunatics or not very ones. Let heaven animate your response right now. Yeah. 
spirit. Awaken that deeper place. And that's where we're going. And it's not stopping. Yeah. We won't be held back. 